Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. I hope that you're staying home if you're able to, and that all of you are holding up and staying healthy and safe. We're bringing a new episode to you this week, and we hope it brightens your day. Here's Daniel Radcliffe who stars in the upcoming Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt interactive special on Netflix. He's reading an essay by David Finch called Somewhere Inside, A Path to Empathy. It wasn't working. Any of it. Our third year of marriage threatened to be our last. I'd become cynical and withdrawn, obsessive and preoccupied dismissive and unhelpful. I don't know when things got bad, Kristen said, wiping away tears. I feel like I've lost you and I don't know what will bring you back. In reality, she hadn't lost me. She'd found me. The facade of semi-normalcy I'd struggled to maintain was falling away, revealing the person I'd been since childhood. I didn't even know what was wrong with me, though my wife, a speech pathologist who works with autistic children, had her suspicions. Even so, it would be another two years before she would put all the pieces together and attach a name to what was ruining our marriage. Asperger's syndrome. During Kristen's first few years of practice, she worked only with severely autistic children. But as she expanded her clientele to include higher-functioning kids, she started learning more about Asperger's syndrome, a comparatively mild autism spectrum disorder characterized by egocentricity and impairments in communication and socialization. That's when she started seeing parallels to my... behaviours. One evening after we put the kids to bed, Kristen approached me with a smile, wrapped me in a hug and asked me to come downstairs to her office. First, she allowed me to complete my 8.30pm routine, fully aware of how essential it is to my peace of mind, circle the downstairs, note which lights are on and stare out the front window, visually lining up the neighbour's rooftops. I finally joined her at her desk where she sat at the computer, ready to administer an online Asperger's evaluation. Looking somehow clinical in her pyjamas, Kristen instructed me to answer the questions honestly. No problem, since I'm honest to a fault when I choose to speak to people. For the next two hours, she led me through questions that at times had us both laughing with recognition. Do you often talk about your special interests, whether or not others seem interested? Ah, who's not interested in cleaning product slogans? Do you rock back and forth or side to side for comfort to calm yourself when excited or overstimulated? Where's the hidden camera? Do you get frustrated if you can't sit in your favourite seat? Friendships have ended over this. And on it went. During the years Kristen and I dated, I was on my best behaviour. When I slipped, she seemed to find my eccentricity endearing. I remember her laughter upon discovering dozens of pictures I had taken of myself to see what I might look like to other people at any given moment. Me watching TV, me about to sneeze, me on the toilet, looking pensive... She loved the story of how I took an emergency leave from work to boil my glasses after they had fallen from my shirt pocket in a men's room stall. She found it pitifully charming when I would stand alone at parties, kind of dancing, or follow her from room to room, unable to engage with anyone else. That's just how it goes with Asperger's. Many of us who have the disorder, identified by the Austrian paediatrician Hans Asperger in 1944, could probably pass for normal if it weren't for three defining characteristics. Egocentricity, odd and sometimes repetitive behaviours, and an obsession with a special interest. The obsession tends to make us experts in strange subjects. For me, motorist regulations, the characteristics of sounds and the behaviour of cattle, among others, with an enthusiasm for discussing them at length at cocktail parties, oblivious to audience interest. 
In my case, a successful cocktail party requires scripting my conversations in advance. On a friendly level, and for short periods of time, I was able to sustain a wonderful version of myself. A casual girlfriend might have dismissed my compulsion to arrange balls of shredded napkin into symmetrical shapes as being idiosyncratic, or even artistic. But Kristen was living with me, and she had become increasingly skilled in assessing autism spectrum disorders. There was no longer anywhere for Mr. Hyde to hide. She started observing my unusual behaviours, rigid adherence to routines, unusual reactions to social stimuli, conditional regard for the needs of others, as I became less capable of hiding them. Before long, my endearing quirks multiplied and became exponentially more annoying until eventually her life was flooded with my neuroses. As I exited yet another gas station without getting gas, she asked, because it has an odd number of pumps. At a Cubs game, after I'd become overly attached to a friendly group of guys sitting near us, she said, Yes, they were fun to talk to, but I don't know if those guys want to be your friends. No, you may not ask them. And, annoyed by my constant questioning about how long the Thanksgiving feast at Aunt Deb's might last this year, she snapped, Why does it matter how long the dinner will be? I have no clue. None. Get over it. Ashamed by my seeming insanity, I withdrew until our life together became long car rides without conversations or laughter, silent evenings watching TV in the same room but feeling worlds apart, months without any real connection. But that day in Kristen's office was a watershed moment for me, and ultimately for us. As she continued her evaluation, I laughed and cried as the questions so perfectly revealed me. My score? 155 out of 200. That meant, as Kristen put it, a whole lot of Asperger's, an armchair diagnosis that would later be seconded by a healthcare professional. I'd spent two decades trying to understand why I didn't fit in. Now I had my answer. As a control, Kristen evaluated herself. Her score, eight. With the data on the table, it was obvious. But naming my problem was one thing, fixing it was something else altogether. How does someone with Asperger's rid himself of the very coping mechanisms that allow for day-to-day functioning? Autism spectrum disorders are not cured with medication, but their associated behaviours can be worked with. What I needed initially were communication skills and a sense of empathy, neither of which, in my case, had been factory installed. Fortunately, I was living with a highly qualified therapist with a strong motivation to help. Her objective? Reinvent our marriage. Her first mission? Figure out how to get me to communicate. I know, a lot of husbands could use a lesson in this, right? For us, however, this went way beyond the typical husband-wife dynamic. Whenever my routine got disrupted or I was made to do something that didn't interest me, I would shut down, unable to engage in any constructive way. To get me to overcome this, Kristen started pushing me to my breaking point, backing off just before I was about to snap. If she thought I could handle 10 minutes of a TV show I didn't pick, but 20 minutes would send me over the edge into meltdown, she would change the channel after 18 minutes. She also stopped allowing me to swallow my frustrations. I would be sitting on the couch, upset about, say, the messy house, and I would hear, Come on, Dave. Out with it. What? Your jaw is clenched and you haven't spoken all night. Minutes would pass as she stared at me. All right, damn it, look, this place is a mess. Any time I need to walk anywhere, I'm stepping on books and clothes and toys and there's piles of laundry on the chairs that need to be folded. I don't see how we're ever going to work if we can't keep a clean house. So we worked on how to vent constructively, a process that began with her actually having to explain to me why my insolent behaviour might upset people. Positive changes, me talking reasonably about a problem, were rewarded with her newfound joy in being in my company, which is what I craved more than anything. A few months later, the same conversation sounded more like this. What's the matter, Dave? The house is such a mess, you know? It's frustrating. Doesn't it seem like we're barely able to keep a handle on things? Well, sure. We have two toddlers, and you work really late sometimes. I can't keep them entertained, educated, on schedule, and keep up with the housework. Something's got to give, and I would prefer it not to be my time with them. Fair enough. Then something occurred to me. I can help, if that's what you need. Duh. That would be great. Actually, you could have picked up this room instead of sitting on the couch pouting. Right. Pick up messes, don't pout, I wrote in my journal of best practices. 
Acquiring empathy seemed a taller order, given that my Aspergerish point of reference is myself in every circumstance. Someone just slipped and killed himself in the men's room? I see. How long until they get him out of there so I can go? But I've learned that people can develop empathy, even if by rote. With diligent practice, it can evolve from a contrived acknowledgement of other people's feelings to the real thing. To that end, I started asking Kristen how her day was, and then paying more attention to her body language than her words. Occasionally, I would have to ask if I was reading her correctly. If I sensed she was tired, I would take the kids out so she could have quiet time. If she seemed really burned out, I would offer to give her a foot massage or to just listen. Soon, these started to feel like real, rather than manufactured emotional responses. We're not out of the socially crippling woods yet, and we probably never will be, at least when it comes to my fixations and repetitive behaviours. Just the other day, Kristen heard me reciting shampoo ingredients in the shower and quacking when I got to the unpronounceable methylchloroisothiazolinone. The two short quacks reinforced the rhythm of the list and frankly sounded hilarious. But overall, I'm a good patient, and we've made steady progress. We've even reached a therapeutic milestone. When something is wrong, Kristen is able to whisper to me those three magic words, can we talk, and instead of shutting down and freezing her out with silent brooding, I'm able to provide an equally magical response. Yes. That's Daniel Radcliffe reading David Finch's essay, Somewhere Inside, A Path to Empathy. Thanks so much to Daniel for going above and beyond and recording himself in his closet using a microphone we disinfected and mailed to him. Daniel is a true pro. We'll catch up with author David Finch after the break. David Finch's essay was published in 2009. He says that when he wrote it, he was mainly just trying to make people laugh. He didn't anticipate it would become one of the most read modern love essays in the column's history. What I didn't know was that so many people would, it it would affect them in a deeply personal way. And it would help them to understand somebody in their life better. I was receiving a tremendous amount of of feedback from readers who had expressed thanks, like deep, sincere appreciation for those 1,500 words that I had launched up into the New York Times. I got a note from a man in his 70s from Australia who had read the piece, and he was thanking me. Oh, my gosh, I've been living 70 years not really knowing why I didn't seem to fit in, not knowing why things were hard for me, not for other people. But, wow, I read this. I totally can relate. I think I might have Asperger's, and I'll tell you what, I feel a real sense of hope. I think, you know, this really, this is life-changing. That's incredible. Um, Not my intention, but I'll take it. Beyond his diagnosis, David says he thinks people connected with something universal in the essay. Everybody's been with somebody where they rolled over in the morning or they looked over at them during an episode of New Girl and they were just like, who did I just marry? (laughs) What was I thinking? Um, I think what then delighted people was that here was a, a husband and a wife who started out as best friends who said, this could take us down, but if we work together, it doesn't have to. So let's try that and see where we end up. But David says it hasn't been easy. What I didn't know was that it would be 11 more years of work for both of us. All the time, every day. Uh, Some days feeling like we don't want to re-up that commitment to working together to, to create the relationship that we want. Other days waking up and thinking like, all right, we got this, let's do this. My favorite thing about my relationship with Kristen is the freedom I feel to love myself and to love her. And um, we're there because she did 
the hard work, and then I followed her example. I'm totally free to be who I am. She feels totally comfortable being who she is. No expectations are getting in the way. And so I think it's, it's the freedom to just show up in love. David says there is one thing he wants listeners to take away from his essay. Understand that whether you're called Asperger's, neurotypical, autistic, not autistic, regardless of what label somebody is going to be able to put on you, um, you're really just a person. That's all it is. We're, we're a neurodiverse species, and that's a good thing. So I hope people take away a new understanding around not only Asperger's, but what it means to be neurotypical and what it means to be autistic in a neurodiverse, neurologically mixed relationship. That's David Finch. He's author of The Journal of Best Practices, a memoir of marriage, Asperger's syndrome, and one man's quest to be a better husband. He and Kristen live in Colorado with their kids, and thanks very much to David for recording himself for us. More after the break. Here's Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for the New York Times. David Finch's essay is one of the most popular essays we've run in Modern Love. And I think part of that is it's engaging and funny, and he's a good writer um, with a good sense of humor. But I think another part of it is, is how eager people are to have a diagnosis for either their health condition or their frame of mind, or especially for, you know, the problems in a relationship or in a marriage. After David's piece came out, we heard from so many women who were convinced that their husbands also had Asperger's and that it wasn't just that they were inattentive or uncaring or couldn't read their emotions, but that there was, you know, a, a name and then therefore a strategy for how to help them with their marriage that didn't just have to do with some sort of routine problem. Um, in, in David's case, you know, it really led to a change in how, um, how he and his wife got along and saw their marriage. And here's Daniel Radcliffe on why he connected with this piece. I picked this story because... I think even though I don't have Asperger's, I think uh, repressing emotion and uh, bottling it up rather than talking about it in a useful way is something that I definitely relate to and is something that I have similarly gotten a lot better at but still have a long way to go. Yeah, I just really uh, I liked the story and it had a very sort of sweet, happy ending. Thanks so much to Daniel for reading this week's piece. He stars in the upcoming Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt Interactive Special on Netflix. Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Caitlin O'Keefe. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. We're edited by Catherine Brewer. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Special thanks to Julia Simon, Anya Stremian, and Mia Lee at the New York Times, and thanks to Michael Garth at WBUR. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.